Hi, today we're going to have a look at lung histology using a variety of slides. If you want to follow along, there are digital versions of all the slides on the website, and the link can be found in the description. The lung can be broken down into two functional compartments, the air conducting system and the gas exchange system. Let's start off with the air conducting system. The air conducting system begins with the trachea, which branches at the tracheal bifurcation to supply each lung with a bronchus. These bronchi produce further, smaller branches known as tertiary or segmental bronchi, which continue to branch down to bronchioles and eventually the smallest air conducting unit, the terminal bronchial. So what we're looking for are a series of tubes which are easiest to see in transverse section as round profiles. This is a slide of inflated cat lung. At low power, we can see plenty of round, tubular structures, so let's zoom in on the biggest one. This is a bronchus. It's accompanied by blood vessels and nerves. The bronchus has a layered structure, so let's start with the epithelium, the layer forming the boundary between the lumen and underlying tissue. The epithelium here is pseudostratified, columnar and ciliated. Pseudostratified refers to the fact that the nuclei of cells are at different heights and positions giving the appearance that there are multiple layers of cells when in reality the epithelium is only one cell thick. Columna refers to the shape of the cells. They're tall and elongated. And lastly, most of the cells are ciliated, and we can see the cilia as these tufty projections from the apical surface of the cell. There are two main cell types in the epithelium, the more abundant ciliated cells and mucus-producing goblet cells. Sometimes we can see the goblet cells with slightly more clear cytoplasm forming a round, cup-like shape, hence the name goblet cell. The mucus is there to entrap particulate matter that's inhaled while the cilia wafts the mucus up to the airways to the trachea and eventually the pharynx where it's swallowed. The epithelium sits on a thin layer of connective tissue made up of collagen and elastin called the lamina propria. Underneath that, there's a little layer of smooth muscle which can control the bronchus diameter. This is great for relaxing to open the airways during exercise, but the muscle can also be affected by histamine which is released during allergic reactions, causing bronchospasm. Underneath the smooth muscle, you'll see lots of glandular tissue. These are seromucinous glands, producing even more mucus for you to cough up and swallow. This tissue is really plastic, meaning it will respond to changing circumstances like chronic airway inflammation, during which these glands expand in size and number. Finally, there are islands of cartilage to give mechanical support to the bronchus. You can see chondrocytes within lacunae and cartilaginous matrix surrounding them. Each island of cartilage has a thin coating layer of connective tissue with some fibrocyte-like cells. This is the perichondrium, and these cells are able to develop into chondroblasts that replace the mature chondrocytes when they die. Quite often there will be lymphoid aggregates around the bronchi, like you can see in this image from a squirrel's lung. These are normal and part of the resident immune system. So, if this is a bronchus, what's a bronchiole? Back in the section of cat lung there's a lovely field where we can see the transition from tertiary bronchus to bronchiole. The tertiary bronchus is very similar to the larger bronchi, but the smooth muscle layer is more continuous. There are fewer seromucous glands, and the eyelids of cartilage are smaller and more irregularly spaced. As we follow the bronchus down, you'll notice a change in the structure. The epithelium loses its goblet cells, there are no seromucous glands and no cartilage. These three features make this structure a bronchiole. There are still secretory cells here, but these are called club cells. These cells have apical secretory granules rather than a large vat of mucus, so they're not easily seen on routine stains. They used to be called Clara cells, but it turns out that Max Clara was an enthusiastic Nazi who used tissue from executed prisoners in his work, so everyone decided to ditch his name from the literature in 2012. There is still a layer of smooth muscle which controls the bronchial diameter. This is influenced by a third cell type, the neuroendocrine cells also not visible without special stains. These neuroendocrine cells release hormones which regulate smooth muscle tone in both bronchial and blood vessel walls. The bronchioles are usually accompanied by blood vessels, and where they're cut in transverse section like these ones, they can be a bit hard to tell apart. 
I made a little video which includes some tips on differentiating between these two structures in case you find it tricky. This is a section of sheep lung. It has some good examples of the transition between the conductive and gas exchange systems in the lung. The smallest diameter bronchioles are terminal bronchioles. These are the last parts of the lung which are purely conductive. From here on, gas exchange can take place. The transition from conductive system to gas exchange system happens in the respiratory bronchioles. In this section, we can see a terminal bronchiole opening out into respiratory bronchioles. The respiratory bronchioles contain single alveoli in their walls like this one here. The epithelium is mainly composed of club cells which secrete surfactant, act as stem cells to replenish the epithelium, and contain enzymes that can detoxify noxious substances. Respiratory bronchioles lead to alveolar ducts which are fiendishly difficult to spot, but we can still make them out as their walls contain small amounts of smooth muscle, such as these parts here. These alveolar ducts open out into alveolar sacs which form the bulk of the lung parenchyma that we can see. This is the main area where gas exchange is going to take place. Here we can see air spaces as clear, unstained space and the alveolar walls or alveolar septi separating them. The alveolar wall is made up of three components, the surface epithelium, supporting tissue and blood vessels. The objective is to minimise the distance between air and blood so gases can diffuse down their concentration gradients with carbon dioxide leaving the blood and oxygen entering. Sometimes it looks like the septum is only one cell thick because we can only see one nucleus, but remember that the cytoplasm from adjacent cells will be forming the three layers in these areas, we just can't see it with a light microscope. The surface epithelium has two cell types. About 40% of the cells are simple squamous epithelium termed type 1 pneumocytes. They're there to form a thin physical barrier between the outside world of inspired air and the controlled internal body environment of connective tissue and blood vessels. The other type are the imaginatively named type 2 pneumocytes, which make up the other 60% of the surface epithelium. Although greater in number, type 2 pneumocytes only cover around 5% of the alveolar surface area. Type 2 pneumocytes secrete surfactant, a substance which reduces the surface tension of fluid in the alveolus, preventing collapse during expiration. In practice, it is extremely difficult to tell these two cell types apart. If you were to point to a random nucleus in an alveolar septum and ask me what it was, I wouldn't be able to tell you. But we can pick out certain nuclei that have certain features and guess at what they are based on those features. My rule of thumb is to look at the nuclei and cytoplasm. A small flat nucleus with indiscernible cytoplasm is likely to belong to a type 1 pneumocyte, and a rounder nucleus with more cytoplasm is probably a type 2 pneumocyte. Underneath the epithelium there is minimal connective tissue with a few fibrocytes which surround the blood vessels. The blood vessels in alveolar walls are capillaries which can fit a single red blood cell through at a time. In this section it's quite difficult to appreciate any blood vessels at all, and in general, as for the epithelium, it can be quite hard to be sure on cell identification. Here we can see three cell nuclei bordering on an area of red staining. This is a capillary, so at least one of these nuclei is probably from an endothelial cell. I took the sample myself and inflated it with formalin to improve the cell preservation. I suspect that because of the pressure of the inflating fluid and absence of normal blood pressure, the red cells were forced out of the capillaries. So let's have a look at another section. In this section of squirrel lung, we almost have the opposite problem in that the lung epithelium is quite difficult to see, but we can clearly make out the capillaries in the alveolar walls because they're filled with red blood cells. Another resident cell type is present in the lungs too, the alveolar macrophage. In the section of cat and squirrel lung you'll be hard pressed to find one because they only really become visible during disease. Luckily the sheep lung section shows them up beautifully. This sheep had a condition called endocarditis where bacteria form plaques on the heart valves. This particular sheep had the plaques in the left atrioventricular valves. This meant that when the left ventricle contracted, the valves were unable to close properly and prevent blood being forced back into the left atrium. As a consequence, there was a build-up of blood in the pulmonary circulation and increased blood pressure in the alveolar capillaries. The increased pressure forces red blood cells out of the circulation and into the alveolar septi and alveolar air spaces. 
Here, the alveolar macrophages engulf them. Any macrophage that phagocytoses a red blood cell has to deal with the iron in haemoglobin, which is metabolised to haemosiderin, forming yellow-brown accumulations in the cytoplasm. In other tissue, these macrophages with golden granules are called haemosiderophages, but in this case they're called heart failure cells because of the pathology underlying their presence. So that's a quick whiz through the histology of the lung. If you're still watching at this point, well done. Perhaps you found this video helpful and would consider subscribing or giving this video a like. You can leave a comment down below if you have any questions or you want to suggest a histology topic for the next video. If you want some more content on normal histology, you can check out this video on eye histology or head over to the channel page where there should be a series on normal histology of a wide variety of other animals. Thanks for watching and until next time, goodbye.